uh, share the screen. Uh, and yeah, this time I'm just going to share the screen. So you, sh you should be looking at uh, a page of the book here. Um, I, I'm, I'm jumping to the end so you can see where we're headed with all of this. Um, so the, the standard model, we started with, okay, these, uh, this first line, uh, this is just like the F star F we use for electromagnetism, the, the Faraday tensor squared, except that, okay, uh, H is the field strength of the U1 symmetry. Um, the charge there is it's called hypercharge, not electric charge. Then here with the Fs, that's the SU2 symmetry. So I here is summed over the, the, the algebra of SU2, that's uh, one to three. And then G is for the gluon fields. And uh, A here is summed over the, the, eight, uh, the eight generators of uh, SU3. And so these are, these are the usual sort of uh, electromagnetic fields. These are couplings of gluons to gluons or uh, W and Z particles to W and Z or uh, um, the U1 gauge field to itself. Uh, you know, fairly familiar. We've looked at that and how to quantize it. Uh, there are a lot of fields here, but uh, nothing, nothing terribly new from that. Uh, then uh, these next two lines are what remains of the Dirac equation for each fermion. So these are describing the fermions. The, the second line here is describing the quarks. The third line is describing the, lepton, the leptons. And uh, as we'll see, we need to divide those into left-handed and right-handed because the left and right-handed fermions couple differently. Uh, that's closely related to what we started talking about last time, parity violation. So we'll, we'll go into a bit of detail for that, but you'll notice also in these, uh, all right, it's a capital D slash here because we're talking about We've, we've made the derivatives covariant with respect to the, um, the symmetries of the uh, standard model. So SU3, SU2, and U1. Uh, so this, this will include, right? Remember when we did electromagnetism, right? Uh, we replaced the partial derivative by D minus I A mu, where A is the vector potential. And when you write out a derivative like this, you've got a conjugate, uh, let's see, uh, just trying to select one of these here, but uh, you've, you've got psi bar ID slash uh, psi. Uh, that gives the, the, the one Feynman diagram where you, you know, you've got a, a psi um, annihilates an incoming electron, psi bar uh, produces the outgoing electron and a photon comes off. Those are the three fields in the connection part of that sort of a term. Well, but now that covariant derivative is covariant with respect to uh, all three of the symmetries. And so this gives couplings between the fermions and any of the gauge fields, either the gluons, which we denote by the, the curly line or the W, uh, the Z naught or the um, photon. Uh, which are described by a wavy line. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about how it is that the left and right-handed pieces get written down separately here. Uh, and that's true for both the quarks in the second line and the leptons in the third. Now, you'll notice in these Dirac-like operators, there's no mass term. And the reason for that stems from, uh, I'll, I'll show you how this works, but the, the reason is because the uh, uh, parity is violated by the weak interaction. And in order to do that, you need an asymmetry between the how the left and right interact. But if you have that asymmetry, it's implemented by making the left-handed fermions doublets. It, they're a pair of spinner fields. The right-handed ones are singlets, just a single uh, spinner field. Uh, you can't produce the mass term. The mass term for the Dirac equation would normally be m psi bar psi. 
we can't write a term like that while violating parity. That's a parity preserving term and it brings in the left and right fields um, on an equal footing. And that would violate what's found to be the case that uh, parity is maximally violated by the weak interaction. So we can't have a mass term here. Uh, what that means is we need a new mechanism to bring mass into the problem. And that's the Higgs mechanism. Uh, this, uh, this scalar field here, phi A, right? The, the A here is uh, summed from, uh, that's actually a, a doublet. That's an SU2 doublet. So phi is a scalar field, but it's a doublet under SU2 and it's complex. So we really have two complex fields uh, to describe the Higgs. I probably should have a uh, different index. That's, that's, not, that's not the same as the gluon index up here. They're, they're just two of these. Um, and I, it's, it's maybe a capital A would be the best for that. Uh, and then there's a potential, this phi squared minus V squared quantity squared is a quartic potential it's, you know, it's the Mexican hat potential that you've probably seen and we introduced a little bit last week, but uh, that's what causes spontaneous symmetry breaking at low energy, right? If the energy is low, then a minimum of that potential occurs when, when phi is equal to V. V is just a constant here. It's just the lowest value of, of that potential. Um, there's a constant term here, v squared squared, that just doesn't do anything. But um, that's how that's how we force the Higgs to take on uh, it, v is a vacuum expectation value. So you know it rolls down the hill, you know, into the brim of the hat, right? And uh, that um, that introduces an effective mass in two different ways. For the gauge bosons, the, the coupling to the Higgs comes in, in this first covariant derivative term. So that's, that's a gauge covariant derivative. Well, phi is a doublet under SU2. So it's gonna to couple to the SU2 gauge fields. And uh, those couplings, when you, when you square out that kinetic term, uh, there's gonna be a term that goes like, um, uh, phi squared times the gauge field squared. And when phi takes that constant minimum value V, that looks like a constant times the gauge field squared. So it acts like a mass for the gauge field. Uh, would it help if I wrote that out? Um, let's see, actually, actually uh, well, uh, I'll, I'm gonna go back up and, and look at that in detail, but that's how the gauge fields remember uh, the gauge fields, let's see, um, if I write, okay, here's what the covariant derivative looks like actually. So the BJ beta, that's, that's a vector field for each of the three SU2 generators. B beta is a, a vector field for the, the um, hypercharge, the U1 gauge vector. So this derivative is covariant with respect to uh, both uh, SU2 and U1. Uh, now, let's see, there, oh, I should probably put the, the SU3 connection in there too, but um, the, uh, the, the thing that causes all the interesting difficulty is the weak interaction. So we can just look at that. But um, this covariant derivative of the Higgs field includes those gauge fields and because it's squared, it ends up giving a term that when phi is constant, looks like a mass for, uh, for those, um, those different B fields, those gauge fields. Okay, then we have another problem because remember up in these Dirac operators, uh, we can't put the mass term anymore because that's not, uh, uh, that, that preserves parity, that violates maximum parity violation. So we need another way to introduce mass for the fermions as well. This, this gauge derivative works for the bosons, for, the, for the, the gauge fields. But 
the, the fermions also need a mass term, and that comes in, that's this last line for the leptons and the quarks. You can introduce a term, uh, and again, I'll write this out. Um, I've got it written out earlier in this chapter. Um, between the, the right, the left, and the Higgs, you can combine those three fields to get a scalar. And uh, then when that um, uh, phi, that Higgs field takes on its, its minimum value, uh, it, it ends up producing the mass terms we want. So that's what all this is doing. And if you write things out, you know, it looks a lot longer. And if, and even in something like this, remember this field is actually being summed over six different leptons, right? You know, this, this thing is huge. If you were to really put in all the different fields, it's just that there's a lot of regularity to what we're introducing for, for, for each quark, we've got a Dirac operator and we've got, these are called Yukawa couplings. And then we have the Higgs field and we have the gauge boson. So that's the overall picture that we are led to. Um, let's go back and see where each of those comes from. Okay, so, and I have a question really quick. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, so, so I mean, so the, so the Higgs field in general, the Higgs mechanism, mechanism in, in general is, yeah. it's like akin to an auxiliary field pro solution, like in special relativity and in string theory that you do. But, but is it more like a goldstone mode? Is it, is it a goldstone mode? No, uh, the, the photon is the goldstone mode. The photon right. is the goldstone so, mode. Okay, so here, here's what happens. Um, it, you have the image of a Mexican hat potential, right? Uh -huh. So you have symmetry around uh, an axis and then you have this well, a high mm -hmm. point at zero and a well. Yeah. And uh, that picture emerges from the way we write this potential. But uh, you can see that if, if the Higgs field is down at the minimum of that potential, then exciting it you know, up and down the brim like this uh, yeah. requires energy. Mm -hmm. Exciting it around the brim of the hat doesn't. Those are all equal energy states. So uh, it turns out that the implication of that is that that mode of excitation uh, does not give any mass to the corresponding um, yeah combination of the SU2 and U1 gauge. I, I guess I guess what that's I meant one, is that's the one you call the photon, but that's a general property of this spontaneous symmetry breaking that you have you that's have a massless goldstone. mode. That's the goldstone boson. The massless mode that generically arises when you do spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay. And, and sorry, then the massive states are are the broken symmetry from that's, the goldstone yeah. mode. Yeah. That's right. Yeah the broken. goldstone the goldstone's not broken. It doesn't require a mass. It's the other modes that do. And it, it, it is that hidden symmetry that gives the other modes their mass. Or, or we invented that symmetry. That symmetry is what we had a mass and we decomposed that, that constraint problem into a U1 symmetry that we, that we then, that we imposed on the problem. Like, like we added, we added this auxiliary field of sorts, but we we used it to fix the mass that was in the equations. That was just a scalar that had the wrong type of symmetry. Yeah, you we can't we can't put that scalar in. We can't so, just put it. It's yeah. not a scalar, just you know, in the okay, same sense you know, that it wasn't. Okay, but, you know, think of it this way. I mean, who who told you to write the Dirac equation? Well, Dirac did, of course. But <laughs> uh, but you know, how did he introduce mass? Well, he put m yeah. times psi bar psi. You know, mm -hmm. that's not the only way to introduce mass. Well, it's even more elegant to put it in dynamically. So it's yeah. it's a, an epiphenomenon, right? It's something that arises from your solution. I, I, I wanna show you exactly how this comes about. So let me let me go back a few pages here and you know tell you the details of this story. Uh, yeah, do you have any questions about the overview? You, you yeah, I had another question then, just about oh. the general Lagrangian setup. Um, oh, 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 if, okay. Sure. Uh, so, so then, so then, if we, if we, if we upped our symmetry to 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 uh, 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 instead of s s s u two to s u n, you know, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, if we if we if yeah. we added if it was o n n as opposed to o o two two, then would would oh. would we just have like uh, we just have uh, 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 
the, these would just be complexified, right? We just have to generalize yeah, well, these what, charges. What, what would happen is you, set of super yeah, charges. Right, this first line would look pretty much the same, except that A would, so for O and N, you're talking about two N, two N minus one over two. So N, um, two N minus one generators for O N cross O N. Mm -hmm. uh, a would run over that range, the, ca the, the little A there. You, you'd have one of these um, gauge field strengths like the Faraday tensor, but for each uh, dimension of the Lie group you're gauging. Then um, Same with here, in, in a covariant derivative, all right, here's a covariant derivative down here. Uh, where did I put, yeah, here's, okay, here's an example of a covariant derivative. Uh, never, never mind the gammas here, but there's a derivative of the field. And then uh, again, forget this, you, you have a Lie algebra valued one form here, that's your gauge field. Mm -hmm. That J would sum over all n two n minus one degrees of freedom of your O n cross O n, right? So you'd have a whole bunch of these summed on the generators, and those uh, around those generators you sandwich uh, a couple of fields. Uh, you sandwich a, a psi bar here and a psi there if that's the kind of vector that that group is, is acting on. So. So you would always have a term more or less like this times the psi bar over here uh, for whatever gauge group you were using. And then you'd always have the, the gauge field strength, um, the field strength of the gauge fields squared. Uh, there's, there's no reason to doubt that that's the right picture. Would you, would you generalize the left and right movers? Would you have like a bunch of different sets in that case? Maybe, maybe not. No, uh, the only reason we need this left and right uh, separation is because the force we're talking about violates parity. And in oh, order yeah, and with supercharges. Yeah, in, uh, in, in order to do that, you, you, need to, you need to treat the left and right differently. But if it preserves parity, like the strong interaction or the electromagnetic interaction, then you, you wouldn't do that. You'd just, you'd just write the Dirac you just write the Dirac operator here for, okay. for, that, for that covariant D slash. You could even use D slash plus M uh, the way we did for E and M. Um, if, oh. if your overall theory preserves parity, you know, the problem is of course that we know it doesn't, right? And it, it doesn't for any fermion. So as long as you've got something like the weak force going on, uh, you're gonna have to separate left and right. But if there was like like in a supersymmetric field, you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily you, you may want to separate left and right, but you'd probably just have some general decomposition of of the Kähler or whatever, right? Yeah, that, you know the the action. There, there's a there's a clever sure. way to do it, right? There, there's a what? Sorry. Uh, uh, there. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Is there a canonical yeah, yeah, way for, to decompose it? Well, you know, for a, for a super field. Uh, the um, you know the the fields decompose. Uh, yeah, I actually wanted to talk about supersymmetry a little next week. Let, let me. Well, you can wait till then. That's fine. Sorry. Yeah, I just yeah. I just saw the full you know, thing it, written out. It, I wanted to see what the supersymmetry thing is. You, know, you, part can, you can have a, a, a super field that is a function. Uh, if you can formulate, you can't always do this, but uh, much of the time you can formulate supersymmetry on what's called a super space. Mm -hmm. And there you have both bosonic and fermionic coordinates, and you can do a Taylor series on the fermionic coordinates. And you know, one scalar field is going to have all these different spins embedded within it because of that. But you know, mm -hmm. I, we'll talk about that a little next week. Um, okay. I'll, I'll have my whiteboard then, and you know, we're we're headed back in a couple of days. And you can kind of do that. Like, there's those dual bases that are like you can switch into each other. You can fermions to bosons. You can. If it's if it's the right type, but, but yeah, let's next week. That's fine. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Sorry, so, Babel. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let, yeah. Let me back up here. Um, let's see. Choosing a gauge. Okay. Not there yet. So last time I talked about uh, just the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Um, uh, does this seem familiar, Kevin? You you got it. Yeah. Okay, so this is just a one dimensional scalar field and you add this quartic potential. Uh, you can show that if you just redefine the field, you can get rid of a cubic term uh, 
or a linear term. So, you know, this is pretty much the simplest thing you can write up the fourth order for any potential. Um, but uh, clearly what you expect to happen at low energy is that the field is gonna settle into one of these, one of these minima. And um, now this is, you know, in a complex space, this has uh, got a rotational symmetry to it. So that's actually a, a well, a one dimensional well. But uh, when that happens, what you can do is, right, so, you know, there's the minimum at a certain value of, of the constants in the action. You can expand around that minimum um, perturbatively. And uh, the, the first thing you look at is um, what happens with the, the kinetic term for that scalar field, uh, say, with a U1 symmetry. Right, so just do electromagnetism, make that field complex so it couples to the vector potential of the U1 electromagnetic symmetry, and the d squared looks like this for a complex scalar phi. Then you can see there's a quadratic term in A that depends on the magnitude of phi squared. Okay, so when phi dips into that well, that's essentially a, a um, constant value right there. And uh, you can identify the mass as being this product of the minima of the well, uh, magnitude squared times whatever coupling constant you, you have in your theory. So this is, this is the general way that we get masses. But now we've got to give masses to three out of four gauge bosons for our SU2 cross U1 symmetry. So let's, let's look, instead of at the general idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking, let's look at how we actually give the W and Z. They're really very large masses, 80 and 90 GeV. Those things are very massive. There's no way to neglect that and say, well, our symmetry is approximate. No, they're big. So, uh, we choose phi to be a complex scalar doublet, right? Now, doublet under SU2. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a scalar under the Lorentz group, right? But uh, it's um, actually four scalars because it's, it's a complex scalar under the Lorentz group. And under SU2, it transforms with these two components. Um, just call them phi one and phi two. And remember phi one and phi two are, are also complex uh, fields. That's, that's the, um, the full Higgs scalar. Okay, so the covariant derivative uh, under SU2 cross U1, okay, ta the, taus are, the taus are just the poly matrices here. Those are the generators of the SU2. And then there's just a, a single quantum number, the hypercharge Y, that um, uh, accompanies the, uh, the gauge field of the U1. So you have four gauge fields here, J equals one, two, three, summed over the poly matrices and acting on phi. So uh, by combining the gauge field with the generator, the tau, uh, you, you build the connection for a covariant derivative of this SU2 doublet. All right, and then, uh, then it's just multiplicative here uh, with, a, with a weight Y telling you how much hypercharge this field has. So now uh, we, we write uh, an action, right? So we take that covariant derivative squared and that's where the mass terms are gonna show up. And then we put a, a quartic potential, uh, writing it this way, just so, you know, it, it makes it easy to see that the, um, the minimum of the potential is where the magnitude of phi equals V. And it's easy to see that there's a, still a phase symmetry left there. That, that doesn't completely um, determine phi. It's going to a minimum, doesn't completely determine the value. There's still a free phase. That, that degree of freedom is the Goldstone boson and that's the photon. Okay, so now, um, oh yeah, I talked about the Goldstone boson here. So we've talked about that. Uh, 
now let's see. So I, I've, I've sprinkled some exercises through here. So you may want to do those. Um, but uh, you know, you can look explicitly at what happens. But the first thing you do, since you have SU2, uh, you know, local SU2 symmetry, you, you can choose a gauge. You can say, well, you know, uh, um, if, I, if I do a local SU2 transformation, I can make the five field look simpler. And, uh, and you've got three degrees of freedom. So we're, we're gonna leave this uh, complex doublet with only one degree of freedom. And uh, to, to see that we can do that, uh, let me see, I came up with a few different arguments uh, for uh, why you can do that. But um, uh, phi, phi is uh, a, an element of C2, the two-dimensional complex um, uh, space, which is, you know, four real dimensions. And uh, what you, um, since you have SU2, SU2 transformations on that space, all right, SU2 is the rotation group in C2. You can rotate um, the direction of any two vector, uh, you know, com to complex dimensions, but you can rotate that anywhere uh, um, without changing its magnitude. And so rotate it to the North Pole. Uh, we're, we're really talking about uh, rotations on a four sphere here, right? It's uh, you know, a, a sphere in two complex dimensions. So, so just rotate it to the North Pole, and uh, you can see that you can you can write phi as some some magnitude times a, a unit vector in that direction. So, notice we've fixed three numbers here. Each of these is a complex number, but um, we remove two degrees of freedom by making it real, and then we make this one or this this becomes f, and that becomes zero. That uses the third degree of freedom. Uh, as an exercise, I suggest that you you know try to do that explicitly. You know, here's here's what the SU two transformation does, and you can find you know a, an axis of rotation and, and an angle that will take any complex two vector to that. A multiple of that unit vector, um, and uh, it is it is so much easier if you work this problem backwards. So start start with um, instead of starting with a general complex two vector and rotating it to the north pole, start at the north pole and uh, rotate in an arbitrary direction, and then just identify the components. It's it's much easier that way. Okay. So uh, do that problem, that's a good one. Uh, in any case, we now have the Higgs field written as basically one real number and a unit vector in a certain direction within that, that uh, uh, group representation, that, that two-dimensional space. Now, here's what we do. Uh, we, we expand that real number as the vacuum expectation value plus some small perturbation, eta. Now, when they say they've seen the Higgs at uh, the CERN, it's this eta field they've actually detected, right? They've, they've detected the coupling of this thing to other stuff, uh, not just these constants. So, you know, you go out and measure the mass of a W and, oh, we've seen V, <laughs> you know, but that's not a proof that that field is out there doing something dynamical. What you have to, what you look for at the accelerator are the interactions of this residual perturbation eta. And uh, that's what they see. So now you, you write out the terms. So um, the, uh, the terms we're interested in are gonna be the quadratic ones. So I've, I've written those out here. I think, uh, yeah, I, I give you an exercise to show this, but um, we're, we're, uh, we're looking at this action. Uh, so um, really the square of the kinetic term uh, with the covariant derivative here is what we're interested in. So, you know, you square that all out and that's some big long thing and you're interested in the quadratic terms. These are the quadratic terms. And among other things, they depend on these inner products of the generators of the SU2, the taus, sandwiched between a couple of 
uh, Higgs fields. And, uh, you know, or just uh, for the U1 symmetry, just the identity um, between a pair of Higgs fields. Well, so the first, so if we want to write this and see what quadratic terms we end up with, we need to write that out. And uh, so, so, you know, here are these terms worked out and, you know, they just end up being proportional to V squared. Uh, you know, the, the product of two poly matrices, you've worked this out, delta IJ plus I epsilon IJK times a tau, right? We've seen that before. Um, or then if, if we just have a single tau, uh, you're going to get zero in, unless it's tau three, because uh, remember this, this is proportional to, you know, it's basically um, a, a two component vector V and zero. So you just get the zero, zero component and the only poly matrix that has uh, a zero, zero component is tau three. So you've got to get three and then you'll get that magnitude squared. And then just phi dagger phi is going to be the V squared. So now we substitute all of that into the quadratic part of the Lagrangian. And uh, the epsilon here is going to anti-symmetrize two Bs, which are already symmetrized by an eta. So that, that epsilon term just goes away. And we just end up summing these two Bs. Um, in, in this term, uh, delta J3, this is an interesting term because uh, what it does is it sets this J to three. So this is the, the, the sigma three part of the gauge field uh, couples to the U1 gauge field. So it's a cross term between those two. And you get a couple terms like that. Uh, then you get the, the U1 field squared. Um, no mystery there, and that comes out with a v squared. And the the u1 and the su2 notice have different um, coupling constants. We we pull out a g and a g prime. So this this simplifies down these these two cross terms. Uh, you basically have two of those. Then um, the uh, so here you, here you have a bi squared. Um, here you have a the the BB squared, and then then you have this cross term between uh, B three and the U one gauge field. So so these two look like mass terms, but this one doesn't quite right. This is this is a mixed term between the two fields. So to resolve this, um, actually Weinberg, this theta uh, used to be called the Weinberg angle. Now it's just the um, the, the weak uh, mixing angle. But uh, the ratio of those two coupling constants is parameterized. And that theta w is one of the things that is measured about the electroweak unification that then goes into all the other predictions. There are only a few things you have to measure in order to start making predictions about what happens. So now putting in that tangent, uh, the, the thing you can do is, um, all right, the, the, um, the one and two parts of this, or, or of, of the SU2, um, just, uh, just sum up like normal mass terms. The, um, so, so I equals one, I equals two are fine, but I'm, I wanna look at the, the B3 because it somehow is combining with the, the U1 field. So here, I'm pulling out just the, the U1 and the tau three piece of the, um, of, of the ST2 gauge field. You can factor it, you know, this is cool. You put in, you put in uh, G tan theta for G prime. And you see that this, this term in parentheses that you're left with is a perfect square. Cool, because now you can write uh, you can write these um, uh, this this third coupling, this mixed coupling, along with the B three part of this term and the B alpha term. You can write it as uh, a constant times the square of a certain combination. That certain combination of those two gauge fields is the Z naught. 
right? You, uh, you identify some convenient multiple of that as the Z naught particle. And then this one quarter V squared G squared becomes the mass of the Z naught. So um, uh, then the, the other two fields, well, the other two fields are a certain combination and those become the W, but there's one combination. There's the orthogonal combination to this does not occur among the quadratic terms. That's the photon, that's the Goldstone boson. So we identify the photon uh, potential with the orthogonal linear combination to the thing whose square appears when you expand that uh, quadratic part of the covariant derivative. Okay, good. All right, so then, uh, sorry, was there a question? Yeah, so um, I guess so if, if the, so the photon is the Goldstone mode um, and yeah. the W and Z in some sense are like the, the bulk waves, um, is the Z something like a domain wall state? Is it something that's like frozen at the, I mean, it, I guess, quote unquote, frozen no. at the base of the, uh, that's what I mean with between two vector fields, you're taking like, two, like a sector of the Lagrangian and then we're finding a massive, like it factors. So we're finding like an exact state in, so, so it's like almost like a, a subdomain quantum state that's exact, that then is bounded by the, by the, by the Goldstone mode and the two Ws. So like the bulk fields and yeah, the- It's what's left after you've separated those out, yeah. So you're, the goal here is just to write the, this interaction part of the Lagrangian mm -hmm. as, as a sum of squares. Right, and, and we've done that. It turns out that, um, well, two of the squares are, are parts of a complex uh, field, the W plus and the W minus, they're complex conjugates. Uh, so you can actually write their action as, as you would the mass term for a complex field. Um, yeah. uh, but, um, you know, and the kinetic term also factors as a WW star. So it's an, an ordinary complex pair. And then you have an ordinary Lagrangian for the Z. Uh, the, the Z just occurs with the, you know, the quadratic uh, partial derivative squared, you know, the derivative squared um, plus, uh, well, plus, plus this constant times Z naught squared. So it's an ordinary, you know, on practically a Klein-Gordon action for the Z naught, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's uh, looks like an ordinary scalar field at this point, but um, the, the way the the real unification that uh, uh, Weinberg and Salam came up with is to realize that you can write it as a linear combination of two different gauge fields from the the U1 and from the diagonal part of the SU2. And then the orthogonal piece of that is the A. So all we're doing here is taking the four gauge fields mm -hmm. of the, the electroweak symmetry and putting them in combinations where one of the combos is massless and the other three are massive. Yeah, and I guess what I'm, I guess, I guess what I'm, uh, uh, what I'm at uh, is, is that uh, uh, the, the massless one is super definitely a field because it's massless. And then the W and Z are definitely uh, are definitely like like global fields. Like they're they they're they have a complex part, they're they're waves here. Um, in the couple in the gauge, in the gauge picture, they're waves. But then the Z looks like it's a fixed point. So that that's why I no, ask if no, it's no, it's it's a free field here. It's a free field with a mass. That's with this mass. All right, yeah, so these, these are, these two Bs are free fields, right? Those are, those are vector fields mm -hmm. in space time. They can have any values at all. Um, Z is a particular linear combination of those, um, but that's, this is still a free vector field. And uh, so is A, A is also a free vector field um, independent of Z. And you work out the Higgs coupling, and when the Higgs takes its vacuum expectation value, oh. Z gets a mass, and A doesn't. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. That that cosine theta is free in Z, right? It's not. Oh, I thought I was reading no, another. Uh, no, theta cos omega. Cosine, oh, uh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, sorry. No, that's that should have a W on it. Uh, oh, see, so w, so that's W is a fixed angle. 
But then does that have okay, photon is, I, is the beta is a fixed angle. I think it's like 28 degrees or something. Okay. Um, that's that's just a constant. So it's a certain linear combination here. I I need a W on that theta. Is and it's the same for the gauge of the photon. Yeah. 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 Right. This is this is it's the same constant in all, all of these uh, expressions. It's that's the Weinberg angle, and it turns out to be um, well, it's equal to the ratio of the mass of the W and mass of the Z if you go back and look at the formulas and uh, that turns out to make it a 28 degrees, 28.15 degrees. So, so every theta in this section is that angle. Okay. It's, so, a so, it's a measured quantity. Okay. So, so yeah, the Z mode is the trap state between the, sorry, the three and the two B fields, right? Which, and then the, the, the W plus and minus are fixed, are the orthogonal combinations of the one and the two fields. Mm, yeah. That's right. So, so we take our, our U2, U, U1, SU2 symmetry, and we uh, decomposed it into all of, it, all of its parts. We found an orthogonal combination in two out of three of them and created W and plus. We used a hidden U1 to construct the photon field. And then we used the Z to be the orthogonal projection to the U1 field. And it's a, and it's a combination no, no, of the Z's, three. No, Z is not orthogonal to the U one. Good. Thing. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. It's orthogonal to W plus and minus. It's but orthogonal it's not to A. So Z and A are are orthogonal linear combinations of these two free gauge fields. Okay. B three. That's, yeah. that's a three. That B three. That's another B three. Yeah. yeah. That. Okay. Yep. That's, mm -hmm. that's yep. the that's the third. That's the Z part of the gauge field of the SU two. The, yes. the diagonal generator. Cool. So, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's, mm -hmm. that's one of the SU2 gauge fields. This is the U1 gauge field. You know, those are free fields. You know, we've got four fields, right? We've yeah. got three SU2 fields and one U1 field. And we're just renaming certain combinations of those. And we're uh, particularly interested in separating uh, the massive from the massless uh, modes of those four fields. There's one massless mode, the Goldstone boson, which we identify with the photon. And then what direction, so yeah, what direction, I mean, if I see the U1 is going in the circle, I, um, what direction does, like, do, is, there a, is there a direction for Z in that? Um, um, yeah, are, you tell me how to draw in four dimensions, and I'll show you which direction Z is. Uh, right. Yeah, I mean, you know, you you have four directions you can go, and only one of them is uh, on an equipotential. But uh, yeah, you, there we you go. Okay. Four dimensional slices or something to to really see which way you're exciting to get the Z. But it, is so, Z then the state that's trapped between different energy states? Then is it is it a bound state in the equipotential? No. Uh, no. No, it's a free field. Okay. Um, I, I, I just mean trap state and that it has resonant modes. So I guess a free would be trapped in that sense, but trapped at infinity. Uh, I just I just mean is it um is it uh 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 what yeah what direction is it? Mm, I forgot. Is it is it a is it a field in the equipotential? Is the no is the, it like a field I mean, on the, the gradient the, of the of the Mexican yeah, yeah. half? All right. Yeah. So, 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 you know, in the one dimensional picture, something that excites you this direction mm -hmm. away from the minimum, you know, would be a massive mode and something that, you know, takes you around uh, a phase probably is a massless mode. Well, but and, and then you have to do that in two complex dimensions to, to really see which way the Z is going, but the Z is going up a hill somewhere. I was kind of viewing the W of plus and minus as waves along that, the two, the two counter cyclic waves, and then Z being something like a momentum trap state where it's like a gradient bound state. So it'd be like the two waves and you can pick how high up they are by the Z degree of freedom. And then you go around uh, to U1. Yeah, no, 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 uh, you know, wrong picture, just wrong okay. picture. You know, that potential is the Higgs field. Yes. Right. You know the the z naught, the w plus and minus, and the photon don't don't live in that potential at all. They acquire you know the constant that multiplies them here in the action um, 
depends on that potential, but really only depends on the minimum of that potential. Mm-hmm. And you know, when you when you do when you do the exercise, you'll see that there are dynamical couplings between the Ws, the Z, and the photon, and that eta, the perturbation of the Higgs field, where the masses of those particles depend on the min, that minimum value only. Uh-huh. So it just you know kicks a constant in in a useful spot, basically. Okay. Uh-huh. All right now. That gives the gauge bosons their masses. The W plus and minus and Z naught are very massive particles, and that's where the mass comes from. That doesn't, give, that doesn't give the quarks their masses. So we need another mechanism to give the quarks their masses. And that comes from what's called the Yukawa interaction. The problem, the problem with uh, masses in the Dirac action is that you have a psi bar psi, and I showed last time how you can write that as psi bar left times psi right plus psi bar right times psi left. That treats the left and right handed parts equally and we, we are not allowed to do that. So what we, what we do do is we write the left handed spinner fields for the fermions as doublets and the right handed as a singlet. And while we can't make a scalar out of that, we can use the Higgs to make a scalar out of that. So what we do first is we, we multiply those two fields. So we multiply psi bar right times psi left. And now, okay, that's a spinner inner product there. So these guys are spinners, right? We need to, we need, if we want to combine with the Higgs, we need a scalar. So first thing we do is we multiply both components of the left-handed doublet with the right-handed uh, barred scalar. And so each of these is, a, a, is an inner product of a pair of spinners. Uh, so now we have a scalar doublet built from the spinner fields. Then we can take the inner product of that with the Higgs field. So this is now a scalar doublet built from the spinners we take an inner product with another scalar doublet, and now we have a true scalar under SU2 and under the Lorentz group, because you know the, the, these guys are all scalars and the Higgs is a scalar. So uh, this term can be added. This is called the, the um, Yukawa interaction. And uh, now, if we, if we look at that Yukawa interaction, when when we choose the gauge so that the Higgs is uh, just this single real component, uh, what happens is it plucks out the, the top piece of the, um, the left-handed spinner and combines it with that right-handed scalar. Uh, uh, but the top piece is, is the electron, the right in, back, back here. Remember, this is the electron and the neutrino, or the tau and the tau neutrino, or mu and mu neutrino. So when you when you combine that with the Higgs, it's going to pluck out the top one only, and so you get an uh, an e right e left, which is just what you need to have a mass for the electron, and then uh, you govern that mass with you know with this constant times the 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 Higgs vacuum expectation value. And so this is where we get masses uh, for, for all of the fermions. We do both the leptons and the, the quarks the same way using a Yukawa interaction. And Professor, uh, yeah. is this kind of like a general, this is like the double coffee trick on the field theory side, right? Like if you have like a scalar coupling that you want to get rid of, you can take two copies of the same field and then find like a a, a, a state on the domain wall between the two or something. I don't know about that battle part, but yeah, you, you might be able to, yeah. In a, this is yeah, something like this ONN symmetry. So you you know you get an ONN symmetry by taking the quotient of the conformal group by its veil subgroup. That's how you build a biconformal space. And that that theory has that ONN symmetry automatically, just from the group theory. It's a lot more elegant than just doubling the dimension for the hell. Yeah, yeah, and just just in these in these low like in our cases where we just have an SU two symmetry, yeah, that's yeah. why you can get away with the doubling, um, right? And with and the, and then on the 
the mass the mass side too and it works for i'm just wondering okay. why so, yeah. doubling you're talking about these doublets here yeah no, just this this trick right here where we added a where we added a like a neutrino field but it's like another auxiliary field and then and then we're gonna it's gonna end up getting a constraint that fixes the symmetry but what we gave it the symmetry of the group well to yeah start. i actually no it's not an auxiliary field it's it's a part of the su2 doublet that is you know the electron doublet right now in this in this way of doing it it comes out massless well we know that's not actually true neutrinos have a mass so you actually um are going to uh, are going to have to put a um i actually talk about this in here and i haven't seen anybody talk about this but you know if if you if you add a, a similar term but put a sigma one in there uh -huh. that's going to interchange the e and the neutrino pieces of that electron doublet and that'll that'll give you a mass for the neutrino and we actually need that you know there uh you know probably what you need is like some rotation of this so sigma one <clears throat> sine theta and uh let's see uh, that's uh, plus right here here just use the identity here use sigma one take a linear combination of those that gives a small mass to the neutrino as well since we know neutrinos do have some very small mass. Um, so uh, really, yeah, the, now this is totally conjecture. I've never seen anybody else do this, but um, to be very equal handed about the whole thing, you can, you can take, uh, let's, let's say a, for each lepton doublet, you take a, a null vector and a null just to, you know, cut down on the degrees of freedom, we know it's enough, but, uh, and take that null linear combination of the three poly matrices and the identity and um, write that as your coupling. And that'll, that'll give masses to both, uh, both fermions and the pair. Um, and we need to do that for the quarks too. Uh, then, um, you know, you could, you could parameterize you know, I give this as an exercise, right? To parameterize that null vector with a unit, um, with a unit vector, and so by you know choosing that unit vector, uh, you know, as just you know your choice, or go out and measure it, you can determine how much of the mass gets given to the, uh, you know, to the up quark and how much to the down quark. So, uh, you know, this is this is a nicer way to to write the um, the mass terms for the fermions. Uh, this is leptons. You could write a similar thing for the quarks, uh, probably with a, a different null vector. And actually each family, okay, you have, in, you know, in this picture you've, we've seen many times of the particles of the standard model. You've got up down quark, uh, charm strange quark, top bottom quark, and then you've got the lepton pairs. Uh, electron, neutrino, and electron, neutrino, so on. All right, so um, uh, you you could you could have an independent uh, null vector for each of those pairs, so that the say that you you don't have a very big difference between the up and down masses, but you know, you have a pretty substantial difference between the charm and strange masses. Uh, and even more difference between the top and bottom. So you just choose you choose this uh, this unit vector a little differently in each case, and you can apportion those masses however is appropriate. Anyway, uh, so I recommend this as a way to, to introduce the fermion masses. But basically what we're talking about for any of them is this Yukawa coupling. And uh, that, um, well, that, that gives just the right mass term like here, say, for uh, for the electron, e e bar e, uh, left and right. Um, this is this is exactly the form we found last week when we expanded this uh, this usual psi bar psi coupling. We wrote that in terms of left and right parts, and we got something just like this. And I, I've given you an exercise where you work out the other couplings. Uh, here, let's let's find it. Um, not quite there. Sorry, just a sec here. Um, where did I talk about this? Yeah, where, where we're deriving the V minus A interaction. 
um, the way you do that is you look at all the possible bispinner uh, tensors you can make and you look at how they depend on on left and right and you see that the the vector um, you can you can totally separate left from right but the the tensor interaction left and right necessarily enter symmetrically well the the scalar also comes out entering symmetrically so it won't there's no way to break parity with that um, so the only ones that violate parity are the um, the pseudo vector here, uh, shoot, this, this guy here, the pseudo vector totally separates left and right and the vector separates left and right. And this again is an exercise, um, but then uh, putting those together, you find that you, you, you end up with a left-handed projection uh, as the, the right combination there. You know, if you just write that left-handed term, um, you can you can show that it equals this, or it uh, or it it's half vector piece and half pseudo vector piece, and that's called the B minus A uh, A for axial vector interaction. Okay, so back where we were. Uh, sorry, I hope this doesn't make you dizzy to flip through here so fast, but. Um, yeah, and then I just think I had a question about that, the, the left and the right. So, so sorry, is that, is that, sorry, and, and am I reading it that, that then uh, the left is a double, that's why I'm saying double copy, because it looks like these are, it's a vector of spinners, that VL is a spinner, right? Oh, yeah, 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 each of those is a spinner. Um, now, so, so the, the right-handed field is like half the dimension of the left-handed field here? That's correct, yeah, yeah, there are two spinners two spinners in a doublet. Now, you could, you could build a tensor, you could take like an outer product of, of mm -hmm. uh, various, you know, left-handed spinners and, you know, have four spinner fields or, you know, higher numbers in some higher rank sort of object. But yeah, but the basic kind of object that SU2 acts on is a two component vector. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about a spinner field in addition, so we need two spinners and all that SU2 does is to mix those two spinners, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it, doesn't care, it doesn't care that they're spinners. It's not doing anything in, in that four component spinner space. It's just mixing these two spinners in, in some, some way. Um, it's, you know, that's, it's like the SU3 of the strong force. Again, we talked about it last week where, you know, all that the uh, strong force ever does is to interchange colors. You know, if you start with an up spinner and act with SU3, you still have an up spinner. It's just, you know, red instead of green or it's blue, but that's all that it ever does. And, you know, that is what has led to these modifications of the standard model because the, uh, uh, what we see are um, flavor changing interactions. We see we, we see, you know, up quarks transforming into down quarks, right? Uh, that's, that's allowed by something that can interchange the fields, the spinner fields in a doublet, right? The weak interaction can do that. The strong interaction can't interchange a U and a D. Only the weak interaction does that. Um, we'll, we'll see that, uh, you know, we have to add another thing because it turns out that in addition to parity violation, there's um, charge conjugation violation and simultaneous violation of charge and parity conservation. And in order to do that, um, that led to the prediction of a third quark family. All right, these, these vertical columns are called families, right? And um, there are decays of say, a you know, a strong quark into an up quark, all right? That's changing the family. Well, uh, you know, it turns out that, that um, we're gonna have to introduce one more thing in order to allow that at all. Because, you know, okay, the weak can interchange vertically, you know, the strong can change color, but uh, we still don't have a mechanism that's going to allow us to have a, say, a. a a bottom quark decaying into a charm quark or an up quark. And yet we see that happen. So in order to do that, uh, 
let's see. So uh, let me let me see where we are. Okay, this this is the final thing we end up writing for the for the for the weak interaction. We have the gauge fields. We looked at this before. Here are the here are the um, kinetic. Can I ask one more question, Professor? Yeah, sure. On the last section. Okay, sorry. Yeah, and then oh, so so here. okay. Yeah, just just and yeah, just 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 kind of relating this. Then then um so so we kind of like we um our our right field here um and I think it was defined just slightly up is uh it's a it's just a regular spinner. So we yeah. kind of like we kind wow. of like um built like a regular like a like a S S U two object, and then we're trying mm -hmm. to use like two separate spinner fields to gauge it effect. Like the, the right phi here would be the top part and then its bar will be the, the neutrino. But we're trying to demand that those two sectors are separate, right? Uh, we're, like this is just ER and zero. And then the other one, I mean, it's no, not no, because it's this in a lower is, no, dimensional this is space. Not a no, but no, yeah. It's, care, it, it's, it's, it's care, a lower dimensional with, space. Alex, careful with your language, right? This is, yeah. uh, this is a scalar under SU2. So any, any symmetry, yeah. all right, any linear representation of a symmetry, um, you, you have a vector space that the symmetry acts on. Okay. SU2 acts on a two-dimensional vector space. SU3 acts on a three-dimensional vector space, red, green, blue. But once you have that vector space, you can construct all tensors over that vector space. It's just like general relativity where, okay, we have Lorentz vectors. Well, we can take outer products of Lorentz vectors or inner products of Lorentz vectors and produce scalars, vectors, mm -hmm. rank two tensors, rank three tensors, rank, any rank of tensor by taking outer products of vectors and linear combinations of those. So once you have a vector representation for your symmetry group, you also immediately have all tensor representations of that symmetry group. That's what we're dealing with here. So we're, what we're saying is that the left-handed fields are SU2, are SU2 vectors. Yes. The right-handed fields are scalars. Scalars. Do yeah, that's what I change under the action of SU2. I need to be careful. That's what I meant. I meant cross zero. They're like they're like the scalar. And then this yeah. we took a bar. So effectively we made our auxiliary fields are, you know, quote unquote, not their left and their left and right don't talk. We've got a We've got yeah. a bar, the bar and the bar don't talk, but we have the thing where the bar and the bar talk and we're trying to gauge them separately, right? The, the right, we're trying to make the gauging look really nice and the left, we're trying to throw all the nasty. <laughs> well, okay. The Just thing so I get the we, picture, right? we, we need, we need the right-handed pieces in order to, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for the photon uh, to um, preserve parity. Right, you, you know, the, the electromagnetic interaction is also parity preserving. So, you know, you, you can't completely throw out the right-handed bits. You, you still need that field, but you, you, you have to control how it enters the theory. And, and um, we're trying to control it by making a two sets of scalars as opposed to one spinner or breaking it into a, a, a uh, scalar oh, and a conjugate. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right, yeah. But yeah. And the there, scalar and the also, conjugate are separate. They're, they're separate. We're not, they're not conjugates of each other necessarily. No, 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 okay. really. These are independent fields. Okay, yeah, that's what I thought. The but, left but the, and yes, you're right. There, there is, there is a right-handed neutrino scalar, right? Yeah, so we, we actually have mm -hmm. six of these scalars, but three of these doublets. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Room service is happening here. Uh, this is my sister. Hello, hello. Uh, this is Alex and Kevin. Hello. Thank you. Hello. I'm bringing coffee. <laughs> what a treat. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. Uh, Prost. Prost. <laughs> we're, we're staying with uh, my sister and her husband, Hanno, here in um, East Lansing, Michigan. Oh, nice. And, uh, you know, we're on our way headed back west. We've just been in Brunswick, Maine for the last oh. week. Uh, where yeah, our trip got altered pretty radically. You know, we, we were halfway out on a leisurely, you know, road trip, basically, you know, stopping at campgrounds and having a good old time. And we got a phone call that Meg's father, who we were on our way to visit. And, you know, it's nice to visit him because it's very relaxed. You know, he's, he's very regular in his routines. You know, on Monday and Wednesday, he has... Um, 
fried eggs for breakfast. On Friday, it's scrambled. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, it's bagels with green cheese. On, uh, let's see, fry, uh, Saturday is cereal and Sunday is a, a muffin. Uh, you know, and he, he, he follows this religious drinking ritual too. Uh, he has a beer with lunch. This guy's over a hundred, right? He's a hundred years old. He, he, he has a beer with lunch. He has a, a happy hour at five o'clock. He'll have a martini or something and then wine with dinner. You know, and yeah, I, it, It's a routine that I am I'm happy to get in with actually. Yeah, look at that. Right. <laughs> anyway, um, we got word that he had fallen in the middle of the night and he broke uh, eight ribs in his clavicle and was, you know, in the hospital for a couple of days and then, you know, in rehab. So instead of, you know, hanging out and doing our routine with him and, you know, having a relaxed week talking to him, we, you know, we were going over to the rehab center twice a day and, you know, uh, meeting with him and, um. you know, he lie there or sit there you know he's doing really well actually you know he's sharp as a tack and um anyway he's recovering, he's recovering well he is yeah he's hoping to be able to come back home um you know he's uh yeah uh, he's been he's been using his walker again he gets around with the walker and um yeah that was you know he's he's weak he's he's very weak but uh geez he's also <laughs> a hundred. So um, anyway, we were going to see him. So we sort of dropped everything, hastened out to the to Maine to see him because, you know, we didn't know how he was doing when he'd just fallen, but he's actually recovering very quickly. Right. And, uh, you know, so now we're taking on the way home, we're taking some of the stops we'd planned on doing on the way out, you know, rearranged everything, but, but hey, that's okay. As long as you're having fun, it's okay, right? Yeah, you know, it's um, it's been good, you know, seeing lots of relatives, uh, you know, a little bit of strangeness along the way, but yeah. but so. And, and I actually had another question then about the stuff up above. <laughs> I know I'm horrible. Hard, not surprising. <laughs> yeah. um, what you got, Alex? When you mentioned that null vector projection, um, oh. is there anything you could get out of doing like a? like a randomized sum over those null vector projections or well, like, uh, yeah. No, no, the, the thing is, well, I mean, you know, maybe you could, you know, work up some dynamics for that vector or something. I don't, I don't know, you know, I just wrote it down because it works, but the, um, the, the values that vector takes are known because we know the masses of the quarks and the masses of the leptons, you know, except for mm -hmm. the neutrinos, we don't know exactly, but, um, Knowing knowing those masses determines those vectors. It determines whatever the mixing of the Pauli matrix and the uh, the unit um, are. So uh, yeah, you know, there's you know, there's something you could go do research on. You know, uh, well, the reason I ask is I think um, I think at least with the double copy story in gravity, which is that uh, you can you can you can model general relativity in the far field by two copies of the uh, of, 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 a, of, a, of a one of an anti-symmetric spin one particle that's just got some arbitrary it'll it'll have different soft coverings or, or couplings you know on it um, but I was wondering they they mentioned the proof that we saw was that we even saw that black holes can be represented by randomized SYK models which are oh. randomized spin oh. one anti-symmetric and so then this this looks like if you took all of the couplings and summed random, it would just look like generic mass under some SU2, U1, some, some symmetry group. So it almost looks like a, do you see, do you see what I'm trying to, just to fill in the gaps of the, I hadn't seen before. Uh, but the fact that this works over any vector. Oh, you're sound. Oh, okay. Came back. Something's wrong. Oh, sorry, so, sorry. Something was funny about your sound there. Um, okay. You know, you know, all right, I should, interject briefly here Please. a bit um, about uh, about these double field theories. This is something I've been working with for 25 years now. And what we've shown is that when you write general relativity in this doubled uh, field theory, um, which we construct systematically from the conformal group, mm -hmm. uh, you, yeah, can, like a thermal couple. You, you, can, you can write a 
an action linear in the curvatures for gravity and mm -hmm. the resulting field equations uh, force a reduction to half the dimension and you're doing general relativity on half the dimension uh, as a consequence of the field equations. You'll see with these double field theories, people talk about section conditions. Yeah. We, don't, we don't need it. You know, that's, that's how they get back to half the dimension. We do mm -hmm. not need a section condition. It follows from field equations. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we've got a lot of results on this stuff. We really should, you know, talk about it more. I think you'd find it interesting if you're working with double field theories. But yeah, and there might be something but, general out of amplitudes too. Is it like but, if you're in a tree diagram that like the three body interaction is all you need if it's convert? So, so it could it be something like you could, you, you know, like even just, just, uh, there's something even really general with this procedure in the double field when you have a, when you're not doing loop diagrams? It, 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 you know, it may not solve every problem, but let, you know, let's reserve that for another time. And, you know, there, Pardon me. There's, yeah. there's another Sorry. thing I got to cover here. Right. You're right. Um, so, all right, this is, this is the electro weak action that we've arrived at with the, uh, you know, these are the, um, the Yukawa couplings, there's there's the Higgs, you know, there there are the kinetic terms with the, the gauge couplings, and there are the field strengths for the gauge fields. So, you know, sort of normal stuff, except instead of mass terms in the Dirac part of the action, we now have Higgs and Yukawa couplings like this that gives mass to everything. And you know, I want I want to make a another really interesting observation here. Um, the final action we're going to write is going to introduce all of the masses this way. There is no explicit M in the standard model. There's no explicit M in general relativity either. So, you know, mass is a classical illusion. There is no such thing. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's low energy phenomenology to have a, this constant appear. Um, it's, that's just like, oh, that's interesting. All right, so let's let's look a little uh, in a little more detail at this because, all right. So I, I want to write this out now, solving for the bees in terms of the the fields we want to identify with known particles. We expand it all out. Okay, so I, uh, instead of writing these covariant derivatives with those original B fields, um, capital Bs, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna make these substitutions and then see what happens. And what happens is, uh, okay, we get W plus plus W minus W plus minus W, you know, the, we just substitute in all that stuff. And then um, we can see what, what each gauge field couples to. So for example, here, the W minus is coupling to uh, Psi and there'll be a Psi bar on the other side of the derivative um, sandwiched between, you know, tau plus, plus I, tau, tau one plus I tau two. So we get specific couplings for each of the interactions. So notice that sum is, is just a projection op or not a projection, it's a, it's a um, uh, what do you call it? Well, it's that matrix, right? It's just got a one in one position. And what that means is that the Ws are gonna um, couple to a lepton bar and a neutrino, you know, this is, um, if, if, I, if we have a doublet here and a bar doublet there, um, this is gonna couple the second part of one to the first part of the other. So you get the electron with the electron neutrino here. Um, and so we can see what the, what the currents are. Um, you just take off, uh, you take off the W field or you think of W as coupled to a current and those currents look like this. They're neutrinos coupled to their lepton. So like the muon coupled to the muon neutrino and so on. Uh, for the Z naught, um, we, can, we, can uh, we can write sigma three in terms of uh, the, the isospin number. So, you know, the plus one in sigma three is um, I equals plus a half and the uh, minus sign is the, you know, the lower right corner of um, uh, sigma three. And so what we get as the coupling to the Z, uh, where did I put it here? Oh, the, yeah, the Z, the Z naught coupling is um, 
I3 minus electric charge times the square of the sine of the Weinberg angle. But here's the interesting one, the photon coupling. All right, the photon couples to a combination of you know, tau three and the hypercharge, uh, this I3 plus YL, well, we can identify that with the electric charge because that's what the photon couples to is electric charge. And so that means that this interaction, we can identify both the electric charge as uh, G sine theta W gives the electric charge and then the, the fundamental electric charge, little e, and then this quantum number is the number of fundamental electric charges and we get the usual electromagnetic interaction for, uh, for the A coupling. Um, and then the Z coupling is just, it, you know, it's an orthogonal combination down here. It works out to be, to be all of this stuff. So, um, so we, we can see what has to be identified as uh, which kind of particle and, and what we identify as the charge of each particle. If you, if you write out what this is with the um, hypercharge of a, uh, a lepton being one, you find that the E, mu, and tau all have charge minus one, one, one unit of uh, electric charge E. So, so Professor, is it, is, it, is it more appropriate then to think of Z as some type of like, the, the Z field as some like the, the sector complement of the electric field? It, it's like some electro weak uh, uh, extension of a, of a scalar radial, that's, okay. Wow. Yeah, that's, okay, dang, yeah, that's so, crazy. So for example, in the hydrogen atom, uh, you you have this interaction of photons uh, exchanged between the nucleus, the protons in the nucleus, and the electron, or the single proton and the electron. But you can also exchange z naught particles. Now the mass of the z naught is big, so that doesn't happen very often, maybe one ten thousandth of the time. But you can see the effect of that in the spectrum of hydrogen. You know, I mean, they know the spectrum of hydrogen, uh, you know, nine or 10 significant figures. So you actually see the presence of an occasional Z naught exchange between the electron and the proton. Of course, it's actually with, you know, one of the quarks in the, in the proton. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, you can write it out, you can expand it and remember, you know, this is, this is a perturbation around that uh, minimum of the Higgs field. There's this, uh, well, in this case, I've written it as rho, but if you expand out the action, you can see how this, this dynamical piece of the Higgs, the rho, actually couples to all these other particles. And there are a bunch of non-trivial couplings there that uh, tell you how you expect the Higgs particle to decay, for example. It's, that's, uh, uh, that's the, those are, real effects uh, that you expect if the Higgs is the correct way to put mass into these theories. And it seems to be working just fine. Okay, then for quarks, we do a very similar thing for the quarks, right? Uh, we have the interaction of the gluon fields with one another. Uh, we've talked about that. We, we need to get rid of this mass. So um, we just have the D slash and uh, the covariant derivative is, um, okay, the strong gauge fields, uh, which I've written as GA here, uh, uh, coupling to the um, quark fields, you know, plus the electroweak couplings, which we've already looked at. And uh, we can pretty much repeat what we've done uh, up to a point. So we write the gauge couplings for the left, the gauge couplings for the right, you know, all that is fine. Uh, and then we put in a Yukawa term. But the um, uh, one thing that's funny about this is if you look at what fields are coupling, all right, here's psi bar of Q left-handed, here's psi sub Q left-handed. And that Q is summed over the um, up charm and top families of quarks. But, um, uh, every single term in this expression for the Lagrangian for the quarks only couples um, up and down quarks to up and down quarks, right? The weak interactions can 
turn up into down or down into up uh, or uh, you know top into bottom, bottom into top. But we see uh, strange mesons like the the K meson can decay into pions. That means that a strange quark is changing into a down quark. That's a, that's a transformation between families. So, and this is you know this is the last like caveat to the whole thing. We've got to add one more thing. Uh, the explanation is that the mass eigenstates are different from the weak eigenstates. So the eigenstates of the weak interaction are different than the eigenstates of the effective mass operator. Now, as a simple example of this, uh, all right, we have this weak coupling between the uh, up and down quarks uh, by exchanging a W minus uh, gauge boson. Fine. What Kabibo uh, suggested as a way to allow the strange quark to decay into the up was to let uh, work with a different state of the D given by some linear combination of the D and S quarks. And that's called the Kabibo angle. But now you couple U bar to D prime and it's actually coupled to both D and S with some parameter that tells you how much those actually have, you know, what the relative probabilities of those decays actually is. Um, well, then it was found that the, um, uh, when they found the C quark, the charm quark, uh, it, it could decay into that too. So now, now you made it a full two-dimensional uh, a, a cu coupling uh, angle where both the D prime and the S prime are written in terms of the D and S as some, some mixture, some, uh, you know, Kabibo mix, mixing angle. And so now you write the, the um, quark interaction as a U bar with a D prime and a C bar, C bar with an S prime. And that, uh, that allows the D or S to decay into a, a U or a C. Um, and uh, now that um, that also uh, allows you to understand charge conjugation um, violation. But uh, then in 1973, it was discovered that the com combined charge and parity were violated. And I'm, I'm not going to go into the real details of how that can happen, but it can't happen with this simple two-dimensional uh, Kabibo coupling. Um, what happened was uh, Kobayashi and Moskawa uh, introduced a three by three and predicted a third family of quarks in order to have enough degrees of freedom in this matrix to allow for CP violation. Uh, they predicted the top and bottom quark uh, as a third family. And then there's a three by three matrix, which is now called the the Kabibu, Kabibo Kobayashi Maskawa matrix, or just the CKM matrix, uh, that um, relates the, uh, let's see, where did I, I just wrote this out somewhere. Yeah, it relates, relates the mass eigenstates to the, um, to the weak interaction eigenstates. So the, um, the, the, the three neutrino fields that um, contribute in the Yukawa couplings come in in a different way than the couplings that uh, come into the weak interaction. So looking back at the Lagrangian, here's, here's how that happens in a little more detail. Um, so what uh, Kobayashi and Muskawa did was to put, put a three by three matrix here that mixed the these, these three quarks um, among each other before coupling them to the uh, Q bar. And that changes the, the um, relative strengths of the weak interactions away from the Yukawa term that gives the masses of the, the quarks. Well, that, that, that kind of mismatch between weak eigenstates and uh, mass eigenstates is what you need. You need you need a difference between these two terms. It's equally good to put that matrix into the mass term, 
mix them mix them there and say the mass eigenstates are these the uh, the weak eigenstates are the ones here without that G and that that still introduces the same kind of mixing between those two sets of eigenstates and this one's simpler so this is the one that's used now um, there's a similar thing that happens with the leptons so uh, what, what would be the analogous thing like a a, a tau neutrino can decay into a muon, uh, say, and you know that's that's uh, changing changing the um, the flavor of the of the lepton. So that's allowed, and that's accomplished with the PMNS matrix. Uh, Ponte Corvo, Maki, Nakagawa, Sakata. A lot of people worked on this thing, but. Um, but you know those parameters have been measured. We we know the masses of the various leptons, and so we we know what these couplings need to be. the The amount of CP violation is very small, so so these coupling parameters, the off-diagonal ones, are fairly small numbers. But that then we put all together and we arrive back at where I started today with the the um, Lagrangian for the whole standard model, which depending on how much you write out, you know, again, remember, you know, we're summing over three doublets of quarks here and six singlets there, you know, there are, there are really a lot of terms in this Lagrangian. You do not want to put this whole thing on a slide in a talk, but, um, but we, we have successfully, uh, all right, we have these gauge fields. This tells us how the gluons interact with one another how the W and Z and photon interact with one another uh, here. And uh, that that bears up over the last 70 years of experiments, uh, 80, you know, basically the last century, pretty much. Um, here are the kinetic terms for the left and right handed uh, quarks, kinetic terms for the left and right handed fermions. Here, here uh, we have the kinetic term for the Higgs particle and the Higgs potential, and then finally the Yukawa couplings that give fermions their masses. So those are the basic elements of the standard model. And as I promised on Canvas, it's more complicated than just that colorful picture of half a dozen quarks and half a dozen leptons. But um, it's driven strongly by the necessities of experiment. And um, even though there are quite a few parameters you have to go out and measure, uh, there are far more predictions you can make uh, for the properties of the various mesons and hadrons built from the quarks, the interactions of uh, uh, all of the various particles we see, and, you know, it works. Um, yeah, I mentioned here the, the absence of mass that, that just strikes me as like, whoa, whoa, that's very strange. Um, here, I, I wrote it out in a little more detail. Uh, I should probably check all this, um, but uh, this is this is posted online if you want to, you know, carefully read through. So here I've given a, a bit of a summary. Um, these are what those gauge fields look like where where the F and the epsilon are the structure constants of SU3 and SU2 respectively. Um, then the U1 is uh, a billion, so you don't have that gauge term here. We have um, six left-handed doublets, three, three quark and three uh, lepton doublets. We have six right-handed singlets uh, for the quarks, six right-handed singlets for the leptons. And uh, we can choose the gauge so that the SU2 part of the gauge so that the complex Higgs doublet reduces to a single real field um, and zero in the remaining complex component. Uh, we identify the W plus and minus as certain combinations of the SU2 gauge fields, the Z naught as a certain combination of the SU2 and U1 gauge field. The orthogonal combination is the photon. Uh, we introduce a, a mixing angle to, to relate the Z naught and photon to those fields. And then finally, we account for uh, family changing interactions by introducing the PMNS and the CKM matrices. 
So that's, uh, that's, that's pretty much the story for the standard model. Uh, you know, there are other subtleties that come up, but yeah, questions. Yeah, I had a, I, sorry, I don't need, if you had any questions, Kevin, I've been all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's, that's, um, yeah, uh, are you good, Kevin? You'd, um, you, you're getting this, right? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm following just fine. Um, okay, good. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, don't hesitate to jump in or, you know, send me an email if you have questions. And, uh, you know, the notes uh, this far are are online on Canvas. I, you know, I suspect I've got a couple of uh, typos or omissions in here. So if you see any when you're reading this, please let me know. Um, I'd appreciate it. So uh, then, Alex, you had another question. Yeah, there's a there's a way that that I've just been um, kind of reading. There's a there's a duality in E and M and in GR with like where you where you can rotate them into their dual fields of sense, where where you take like the electromagnetic tensor and product it in with the levisivita, and then you'll get a, a dual um, a, the dual oh, form. Yeah, it's just yeah. G, and the, you can. You can formulate E and M the self dual pieces, yeah. And then you could you could formulate E and M by just having a rotation angle between those dualities, and then you'll get the same equations out. And you you could do the same thing in GR, where you take the the uh, the curvature tensor and form a duality the same way. Um, and uh, there's, there's you, you do it in the first two. You do it in the first two indices. Yeah. There's there's yeah. a caveat with that. Um, it depends on the nature of the sources whether with sources, you can do those same duality rotations. But yes, absolutely, certainly the yeah, vacuum. Because you have, you have to you have to rotate what the charge means too. You have to rotate what the electric charge into the magnetic charge. So and it's, if E and M, if you have particles with different charge to mass ratios, the you can't do that rotation with them. If you only had one charge to mass ratio in the world, that would work all the time. Right. Okay. It, doesn't quite, but since there's no such thing as mass, you know, maybe that's not such a problem. I don't know. <laughs> um, <You're right>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, my question was whether all these mixing angles are, are kind of basically the same idea, except we don't have like a nice global symmetry, maybe like we do with, or if we do, it's 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 more coupled into the other 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 fields. So I guess what I'm what I'm asking is is like um, for this z particle and and for the uh, CKM and PMNS um, mm -hmm. mixing angles. Are we are yeah. we kind of doing that where we have like the linear combinations of the symmetric particles that we know are showing up, and we're just going to mix them in some way to preserve the overall symmetry, and then we're going to use those mixing angles to fix the rest of the stuff. So it's it's kind. I'm wondering if it's kind of that's the math trick that we're doing is the same thing as the duality construction, but duality means something slightly different here. It's well, a sector duality. Yeah, I'm not sure what you mean by sector, but yeah, I don't either. But yeah, you, you know, we yeah, we have we have two types of things, and we're taking certain linear combinations of them to be able to identify properties with the properties we see in scattering experiments. So, yeah, we we know that um, among the four gauge fields of SU two plus SU one, um, there's there's um, if you couple with the Yukawa coupling, uh, you know there's going to be there's going to be a massless one, right? And the other three will uh, have um, will have affected masses, and that's just what we see. Um, you know, it's uh, you know basically, you know, it gives one extra parameter you have to measure that Weinberg angle, or equivalently the ratio of the masses of the W and Z, and then uh, it makes, uh, um, it predicts particular interactions. So uh, the, the Z naught was first referred to as a weak neutral current, right? It carries no charge, you know, it's, it's one of the weak currents. And so there, you know, there were searches for weak neutral currents and they found them, you know, they're really there. Uh, and that's the way it couples. Now, as for mixing, yeah, self-dual and anti-self-dual. I've actually been looking at that quite a lot in, in relativity and uh, related areas. Um, the the left and right-handedness here is uh, the same as the projection uh, in relativity between self-dual and anti-self-dual. If you're using a tensor risk 
or a, using it, it's been a representation there. So, you know, these, these actually are the self-dual and anti-self-dual pieces that we've separated here. Uh, the left and right are. That's where I was gonna, um, uh, uh, that, that, uh, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, obviously that, and that's where I was trying to, to, to get at is I've seen the, 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 uh, the, the black, uh, the wild scalars is what I've been looking at. So I'm just trying to wonder if there's a, there's a, there's a, an interesting way to, to view it, to view these, the weak force in terms of the vile scalar. I know there's a way to do it through E and M because uh, there's that, there's those midfield charges you can get the, the uh, tensor the, fields. The veils, uh, what do you mean by the veil scalar? I, uh, well, they're like, you take the, the Penrose tetrad and, uh -huh. and, uh, start like find the, there's like five independent combinations of, uh, the vial curvature scalar that you can get out of that. It's like that, take the two time likes, uh, take the two time likes and mod it in, put the, the M, like the celestial sphere, I think is the okay, kind of quote this picture. Is the Newman Penrose decomposite. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then if you take the, the, the mid range one, the one that's effective in the midfield, you get, you get, you get E and M effectively out, but it's got a, Instead of an electric field, it's an electric tensor field and a magnetic yeah, tensor sure. field. The, I was wondering, the yeah. The parts of the curvature, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and I was wondering if there's a, there's an, an out, like, um, and the way that you get to those is you kind of use the mixing angle. Oh, there's one way to do it using mixing angle symmetry. Um, and I was wondering if there, since we, since it's coming up here with the electro weak force mm. and, and, there they associate just the mid range with the E and M. That's the paper I'm reading for simplicity. We're doing it for simplicity, getting those fields out. I was wondering if there's a more exact way to use I, all five vial curvature scalars to match to like the W plus minus Z photon coupling and mass, I guess is what it would be. Because uh, they're far and short range. Yeah, um, you know, you, you may need you may need all of those for gravity, right? So maybe not that way. But um, I am seeing in these double field theories uh, a way to use the extra n dimensions as uh, an electroweak symmetry, um, so that you know within yeah. the, within a gravity model you will also have the uh, the electroweak interaction occurring geometrically, naturally. And the, um, I'm wondering if the, the um, you know, one of these mixing angles isn't the, you know, the angle between the two n-dimensional spaces. Yeah, um, right, yeah. You know, which there needs to be in order to make this work right. Um, you know, more on that in the next year, you know, that's actually a project I'm currently working on. So- Are you, I mean, the, I think we, we were reading a paper that was using the double, like doing a Kerr black hole and doing a double field cover of it. And they were, they were exclusively using the, 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 the second file scalar, I think, because that, and that's the one where you find the E and the B fields effectively, the tensor. Um, uh -huh. I, I, and I guess, is that like the, uh, is, is, I mean, would that be the section you're looking for? Because they, they, they use the duality in that sector, because it it combines the 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 uh, the dual and the the regular field on equal footing, but I'm just curious from your end, where where do you study? Uh, what sectors are you looking at? Yeah. Oh boy, let me let me see the um yeah uh all right the the sectors divide okay the yeah. The, the, the left and right um, also correspond to positive and negative conformal weight. So we really break things up by the way they transform under conformal transformations. Half of our fields um, you know, pick up a factor, the other half pick up one over that factor when you, when you rescale. And that gives a natural separation into two subspaces. Um, the mixing between those Hang on, let me see. Is, if I... is that a, is that a little group scaling? The conformal no. scaling is that? No, no, 
Uh, okay, but no, this, yeah. this is the underlying symmetry of the whole the whole model. We start with the conformal group and gauge it to get a gravity theory, and we show that that gravity theory, you know, given such and such a Lagrangian, is general relativity. You start by separating out into the the scalar, the one and the one over eigen eigen yeah. subspaces. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The yeah the um, close and the far. Yeah, it's it's unusual among conformal uh, gauge theories in that um, by doubling the space, uh, you have a dimensionless volume element. You know, because half the basis forms, you know, half your solder forms scale up and the other half scale down. So when you take the wedge of all of them to form a volume form, it it's um, it's dimensionless. It doesn't scale. That's what allows you to write an action linear in the curvature. Um, unlike most conformal actions, uh, you know, like in, if you try to write a conformal action in four dimensions, it's got to be quadratic in the curvature. So you get fourth order field equations and, you know, that's, and it still looks a lot like general relativity if you do it as a gauge theory, interestingly enough. Almost anything you do does, but um, still, you know, it's, it's cleaner to get this doubled space, which turns out to be, you know, have complex structure. It's, it's a Kähler manifold. Very pretty stuff, but you know we you know we should we should have a meeting when uh, you know we're not dragging Kevin through general okay. relativity as well as field theory. I mean, no, general I, relativity is all good. <laughs> okay, no. yeah, I, yeah. I hope you find some of this interesting. Yeah. We, we we get a little afield sometimes, but um, yeah, uh, you know there. Um, I'm very excited about this idea. Uh, I, let's see. I did a paper. Let me, let me think. Um, yeah, actually, a, a few years ago, uh, a paper I wrote on how to get general relativity from what we call biconformal gauging of the conformal group. Uh, you know, it's it's the generic solution and the uh, on on half the manifold. The other the other half, the other n dimensions. You do this in any dimension, any signature you like, but Euclidean really works best. Um, uh, we we've shown that in um, many circumstances, starting Euclidean forces Lorentz signature on the space-time. But in any case, you, you have these two natural n-dimensional submanifolds, and um, one of them is always a Lie group. So, uh, it, it, you know, generically, it's an abelian Lie group, but there's a special case, a, a class of special cases where that extra n dimensions is a non-abelian Lie group of a fixed dimension. If you do this in four dimensions, that that Lie group has to be a subgroup of. You start Euclidean uh, in four dimensions. You build this eight-dimensional space um, with Euclidean symmetry on uh, the whole thing, um, uh, uh, four-dimensional. You can show that the extra four dimensions that don't become gravity uh, can form a non-abelian Lie group um, of dimension four. And it's gotta be a subgroup of SU2 cross SU2. And if you look around for uh, subgroups of SU, four dimensional subgroups of SU2 cross SU2, uh, it doesn't take you very long to see that it's SU2 cross U1. And you're, you're forced to the electroweak group on, on the extra submanifold. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know it's, it's a very cool result. And, you know, we're hoping that uh, by the time we, um, we do the splitting required to put Lorentz signature on the other half for the gravity theory, that uh, that introduces an angle. And, uh, well, I, I can't help feeling that that angle might be the Weinberg angle, but you know we're we're not there yet. We've gotta, yeah, the yeah 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 the analogous part of that in the vial scalar configuration, or yeah yeah yeah, yeah. isn't that yeah? I think and I think we saw at least in the amplitudes class like the invert the converse too. Like if you have any any spin two field, uh, any spin two field symmetric spin two field, you can mm -hmm. represent it by something that uh that that looks uh uh like this strong 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 force but 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 a color a color force um i think it just comes from if you if you have an effective field theory um you you 
the way they showed us is break it into the helicities and then in each helicity group you'll you'll get a copy of the 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 color trace equations and yeah it's kind of it, it's like that weird amplitude trick where you just start huh. looking at the symmetries term by term um but so yeah, they, yeah. She, she showed yeah. us the other way though too where you can start with general relativity or a graviton you know and then get out um uh uh a uh, 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 color a uh, color field a double copy a double copy of a color field so it goes both ways <laughs> i think is the but i yeah yeah, yeah. And I just, yeah. I wonder, have you, I wonder if, um, is there a conformal, like is one of these, they didn't explain it to us in terms of one is a conformal, but we were using like little group scaling to, to separate the helicities out. And so oh, yeah, like, sure. did we do, sure. do it's like, is the, it with the, and, and in that sense is like the little group, like the, the babyest, can, like it's one, where does that fit in this? this picture, I guess, or, but yeah, I guess. Well, the, the little group is, essentially that's just what you get if you you pick a time and look at the residual symmetry, right? So you have Lorentz really symmetry, you fix yeah. the time, you still have this smaller group. And, you know, you can look at that on the light cone or on just on a spatial slice, you know, it's a, yeah. in one case it's, but like SO3 and the other, it's going to be, I think it's a U1 cross something. I forget. U2 or? Yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah. SO2 probably. S SL. Yeah. I think it's SL. Um, SL. Okay, sure. Yeah, SL. Yeah. It has got to be. Yeah. Yeah. So you've, you've fixed one space time direction. And, you know, that's the symmetry that's left, depending on how you, how you look at it. Yeah. Okay. They were, they, you know, they were phrasing it in terms of, oh, we're, blowing up one leg and cutting one leg off. So you're like in the frame of the particle that's coming out. But I hadn't thought of that in terms of a time slice and then the symmetry. Yeah. yeah you're, you're basically picking a direction and looking at the residual symmetry. Okay. And, and that's why you promote it to, to conformal and general relativity because you don't have that time isolation necessarily. Yeah. Okay. I'm seeing this picture. And then um, uh, uh, Dang. Okay. Okay. Cool. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna stop the share here. And um, so um, let's see. You know, I think uh, let's see. I don't know when the technical end of the semester is. I mean, you know, we're doing this because you folks are interested in this. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we can we can do this as long as we like. But uh, you know, I I think I would like to talk in the next week or two a bit about uh, string theory and supersymmetry as things that you know are happening more currently with uh, mm -hmm. with these ideas um you know uh basically finishing what we know you know the the uh the standard model really works and uh has held up to uh, all tests you know probably not ending with the the Higgs, but there are there are still some open questions, and one of them involves how you bring gravity into all of this. Uh, so far as we can measure, the standard model gives a really good prediction of the strong and electroweak interactions. Um, you would you would like to see uh, some kind of unification between those things. Um, you know why why these particular three uh, fundamental interactions, gravity, strong, and electroweak. And, you know, there are theories that address that. Uh, the, um, the most successful, I would say, at addressing that has to be regarded as string theory and uh, its various descendants, these double field theories are. The uh, double field theories arose uh, in string theory as a way of making um, one of the dualities uh, um, manifest. So uh, it, you, you have these dualities between distinct string theories, uh, which basically depend on the boundary conditions you impose on the string. But it turns out that, you know, this string theory is really the same as that string theory. If you expand around the inverse to your expansion parameter in this one, you get that one. And, 
Uh, so there are these relationships between pairs of theories like that. One of them is related, is dual to a um, supergravity theory. So in a sense, you really only have three and people have tried to find a space where, you know, these dualities are manifest. And one way to do that is by doubling the dimension. So that's the way that um, string theorists, uh, who was it? Um, this guy, I think he's at Cornell. Um, yeah, I, I, could, uh, I could show you a paper that uh, I wrote a few years ago that references these things. I, I'm forgetting exactly the, um, the, the people who first introduced that. The, actually, these biconfirmal spaces predate that. They, they go back to the early 80s, uh, whereas double field theory was introduced in the early 90s. Um, and, uh, you know, these are, these are actually pretty much all the same thing. Kähler manifolds and double field theories and biconformal spaces are, you know, really uh, strongly overlapping. Um, you know, I've uh, I've wondered if I can show that, um, you know, any one of those can be written as any of the others, <laughs> you know, or you know exactly what the relation between those three kinds of space is, but. Um, I mean, the ADS CFT kind of is this too, right? It's kind of an extension of this idea. Because you get a, a left and a right field is ISO to the to the ADS space. Yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, so is is that is that um, a double field theory in the usual sense or is that a different kind of... Uh, uh, yeah, that would be my question. I don't know if it's, it's not exactly... It, it is... Or dual, I guess, I guess you'd like... Um, you could you could work in some encompassing space where you know the the relationship between those two is is manifest. That would probably be a double field theory. It might be this biconformal might be the word that, because uh, because they're the 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 CFTs are on the boundary of the spaces yeah. and they're and they're at infinity, so it could be a yeah. conformal. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what happens. You, well, it is a conformal. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It is. It's an asymptotic a paper on that, where yeah, where you get to the boundary with a conformal transformation, and that's equivalent, right? Uh -huh. uh, you know, within a conformal theory, that's got to be equivalent. So, uh, a class of theories where those are equivalent are probably biconformal theories. Yeah. And I think like, and so then the interesting other option, I think that's coming out like this summer that people are really, really, but these last two years that people are really looking at uh -huh. um, seems to be that you do this, you do the like ADS CFT and then you get the biconformal spaces. And then you try to, you try to form some product group on top that factors, right? And I think this is usually where the monster group comes up because you get the partition oh. function cross its holomorphic dual and you, you figure out in three space that it's got like way too many group elements to care about. And then you usually try to impose subsymmetries to break it up. Um, and it sounds like, it sounds like the idea might be to, instead of trying to build that product of the holomorphic copy that products together, um, that, uh, that they would have the global Minkowski symmetry it sounds like, or that they, they would have, they would be globally ISO to the ADS space. Um, it sounds like instead that you you want to, they're, they're thinking of uh, 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 looking for point-wise CFT duels, and then um, instead of a global CFT duel, and then try to product them together and then find a, a global factoring. So it's almost like there would be a, instead of having a CFT that is globally in thermal equilibrium with itself, you'd have mm -hmm. one with heat currents point wise and try to project onto that. Huh. So kind of like kind of like in StatMech where they the, the heat isn't stationary, but the whole body has an ISO temperature. So you want you want to have all the statistical CFTs blowing heat into each other, even though the space time is homogeneous. And so I guess the image would be that yeah. like gravity is straight up a hologram because it's it's like a it's like all the fields that are interacting too strong to interact at the far field statistically combine into a into a like I think that's kind of M theory, right? On the JT gravity side. 
<laughs> that's kind of how they try to interpret gravity. Right. Yeah. But yeah, it, you know, whack yourself alongside the head anytime you say kind of. <laughs> uh, you know, it, you know it. Well, the thing is, you know, it takes you know many months of research to make any one of these ideas precise. Yeah. Oh, and that's the challenge of research. You know, there's mm -hmm. there are a lot of cool ideas floating around, but you've got to you know wisely uh, pick one and work it out in detail so you understand every aspect of it. And, and that's, pick another. I'm trying anyway, to play baby uh, catch you know, up, we're, but we're, yeah. we're, we're stay, straying away from uh, field theory here, quantum field theory. So, um, well, you know, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to stay and talk, but I'm going to stop the recording. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. I just kind of drive that because as a 